turkey coma going on, right? A little extra tryptophan and, and things like that. So uh, uh, welcome to everyone. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. And uh, Lord, I don't just mean the printed words on the pages of uh, the good book, but the word Christ uh, who came down, lived it, uh, demonstrated it, taught it, and then now sends it out in the form of your church. Uh, Lord, may we listen and learn. May we lean in, be transformed. So as we go out, we're proclaiming the truth. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, special welcome to those of you joining us online this morning. Uh, as always, the uh, the Bible study uh, sheet is available on our website, uh, faithinjeffcity.org. And uh, follow along there. We're starting a brand new uh, study this morning. A uh, fancy churchy word called apologetics, and uh, it really follows uh, very well after our study on Luke, and uh, that'll make some sense a little bit uh, as we get started this morning. Um, so if you are watching this morning, would you just do me a favor and just say good morning underneath the video and so that we know you're there and, and uh, thank God for you and, and uh, stay connected in some ways. So 
Um, why take this time uh, to study something called apologetics? I'll define it for you as we go. But it has to do with putting to work what God has taught us, right? It is about defending the faith. Now, I, I would tell you that there is no more important time than right now to defend our faith uh, in, in this time of history. That's kind of irrelevant. If you're alive, it is an important time to defend your faith, right? We couldn't just sit there and go, well, things were really bad 50 years ago, or things are much better than they were 50 years ago. It, it's, it's irrelevant because if not everyone in this world knows Jesus, we have work to do, right? Now, I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing, and I want to demonstrate that with um, my Leatherman. This is a Leatherman. It's kind of the modern day version of the Swiss Army knife. And uh, so my Leatherman case, uh, if you can see it, it's uh, pretty banged up, right? And uh, if you look at this thing, you'll find that there are parts and pieces in here. Uh, some of them are just a little bit worn. There's a chip out of that screwdriver head and things like that. And the reason being is because it has been used over and over and over again. Nothing would be sadder to me than to have somebody wearing this on their belt buckle that looks pristine, and they tell me, I've had this for 20 years, right? The whole point of having a tool is to use it, right? In fact, Jesus says in, uh, in one particular parable, Matthew 25, it's the master uh, who leaves and puts three servants in charge, and he gives them talents. One he gives five talents, the other one he gives two talents, the other one he gives one. So three servants, five, two, and one talent. The first two servants put the talents, the money, to work. Invest it, work with it, and when the master returns, they return back twice as much. The one that had five delivers back ten. The one that had two delivers back four. The one that had one says, I know that you are a tough individual. He also had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. Now, what I want you to understand is the whole point of us coming together for Bible class, the point of us coming together for church, right, is to sharpen the tools, right, but then use them. Right? It, is, it is not just to learn more. Okay, um, I, I've, I've shared this many times. I'm going to share it again. If you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, you cannot get any more saved. There's no need to invest more time here to say, I want to get extra credit. Right? I want an electric harp rather than just a run-of-the-mill harp or a bigger halo or, or whatever the case. By the way, you're not getting a harp or a halo. Okay, that was, that was three months ago teaching, okay? But the point is, is there's not a test to enter in. The more you know, the, the more likely you are to get into the kingdom, right? This is simply, do you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Well, then get going, all right? So I want you to know that this is important for us to know and to learn, but there is a point. There's always a point to the work of the Holy Spirit within his people, and that is to tell people. Now, I imagine that most of you realize that our faith, right, the Christian faith in Jesus Christ is under attack. It has been under attack since Satan tempted Adam and Eve, right? It has always been under attack, and the, the defense of it is necessary to draw people to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. It does not happen by accident. I, I don't know of a single circumstance in the Bible, nor have I ever experienced one in real life, of somebody just accidentally learning about Jesus and coming to a saving faith. It has taken things and people and actions and, and uh, revelations and things like that. But it doesn't happen uh, in isolation and it doesn't happen by accident. So here is going to be at the top of our page. Uh, this is going to be our theme verse uh, for this study. Verse Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, honor Christ as Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect but do it with gentleness and respect. And I tell you that I'm as equally convicted, I hope, as you are. Uh, I was not always good at that. Uh, there was time that I wielded my knowledge of the Bible and of God uh, like a blunt weapon, thinking I could just bludgeon you into heaven. I don't think that works, right? Uh, and yet I, I've shared with you guys, you know, my, my teaching on uh, creation evolution. Um, I used to just want for somebody to challenge me 
on science, you know, me being a biology teacher and so forth, and go, just challenge me on this. I've got all the answers, right? And, and all those answers will just convict you to want to know Jesus more. No, it just meant, I just want to avoid Gled Hill, right? That's what it came down to. And so it isn't for us to, you know, uh, uh, you know, diminish someone. We'll talk a little bit about what that looks like today. But the point is, is we want to do so with gentleness and respect. You want to lead somebody to Jesus, right? I have never taken anybody's arm, spiritually speaking, behind their back and go, say you love Jesus, right? Say it. And then something kind of good, another win, right? Another little notch on my Bible case and moving on to the next person, okay? Even Jesus didn't act that way. It was always an invitation. So let me kind of tell you why we're doing this today. We're going to jump into Acts. Acts is the first book of the early church, essentially. And Luke wrote Acts. So it really is going to lend itself very well to following what we've just covered uh, the last six weeks, talking about the life of Christ according to Luke. Now, if someone here were to describe Luke's approach uh, to demonstrating uh, who Jesus is, how would we describe it? How did Luke do it? Analytical, right? Just the facts, ma'am, right? We kind of talk about Sergeant Friday. Um, and so you're going to find that Acts really kind of follows that same structure. There's a fair amount of discussion of here's how, or this is a description of someone doing um, apologetics. And I'll, I'll walk you through that a little bit. If you would, uh, on your in your Bibles, open up to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17. And uh, I'm going to read a few passages you can follow along, but I want you to see this, is you're going to see the early church function a great deal in the realm of apologetics, right? Uh, they, they were functioning this way because this is something I believe that we as a church have drifted from. I think we are very satisfied as the church in just kind of going, well, this is how I learn and this is why I come together. Um, we are not called to be church for an hour or two on Sundays, right? What is this? Halftime. This is halftime, okay? Now, so if you understand halftime, the point is there's a game going on. We come together, we get into the playbook, we talk to the coach, we get bandaged up, we get some nourishment, and then we get sent back out. Out is actually the key, okay? And, and so as we see this, defending, walking, demonstrating with gentleness and respect, that's the game. Right? That's the competition out there. And, and I'm telling you, our enemy out there does not take time off. And we can see that in our world. Right? It, it, Satan does not take half time off. Uh, he does not take off season. Right? He is always at work trying to erode and destroy what God has built. So Acts 17, let me just begin with number one. Paul and Silas in Thessalonica. Now when they had passed through Am, uh, Amphipolis, and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and a few of the leading women. So uh, one of the things we see in that is we see him defending scripture. And it says, as was his custom. This is what Paul did. When he would go around, he held Bible class, right? Now, they didn't necessarily have the New Testament like you and I have, uh, but they would have preached uh, from the Old Testament, what they would have called the word, right, the book, uh, and, and then naturally would express things that Paul was aware of, uh, and then other disciples and things of what they experienced with Jesus. Now, this was the key to early apostolic preaching, was defending the scriptures, because most people wanted to say, what you're teaching is different. Why should we follow it? Why should we believe you? Why should we trust you? Guys, this is one of the reasons I believe that Jesus spent 33 years on earth, right? Jesus could have accomplished the act of salvation in a matter of hours, even in, in human standards. But if he would have done that, nobody would have really known him. Nobody would have understood him. Nobody would have seen it acted out and lived out and so forth. So for 33 years, technically only about three plus years of public ministry, he lived out the salvific act uh, that he came to fulfill. How's that for word usage? Salvific, right? My wife has given me the thumbs up. I just made that. I, no. 
He sounded like one of my students when I was in school, and they're like, I think you're making that up. And I'm like, I probably was, but you don't know any different. I'm the teacher. Hey, Siri. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be glad if Siri knew the, the word salvific, right? So, um, so let's look at verse 16 and forward. If you're in your Bibles, go to 16. Now you got to turn Siri off, right? 16, Paul is in Athens. I love this one. This one's great. Now why Paul, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him uh, as he saw that city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue. There's that discussion. He reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Uh, because he was saying things that were really different. Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinity, saying something we don't know anything about, because he was preaching Jesus and a resurrection. And they took him and brought him into the Areopagus and said, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Um, now we could probably debate this of whether or not our world is more or less open to new information, okay? Uh, as we all have um, rapid access to information like Siri, right? Uh, I don't think Siri's going to evangelize too many people. Uh, it's not her job. Um, it's job, right? Uh, but the point is, is that because people have instant access to information, we're on information overload, and there's no real way to determine whether or not it's true. Uh, you know, I, I hate to quote uh, from someone that kind of is controversial in, in some ways, but when we talk about fake news. That's been, you know, kind of cued for people. And so when you have that doubt of a source, suddenly there's doubt everywhere, right? As soon as I disagree with it, I just doubt it, right? Whether or not it's true or not is actually a distant consideration. I just go, I don't like it, therefore I don't have to listen to it. I remember my father uh, when, uh, when, when he was alive and the internet really started to catch up. My dad would send me things that he found on the internet and he would go, look at this, this is true. And I'm like, dad, just because it's on the internet, does it make it true? I said, because anybody can post anything. No, no, no. It was printed on the internet, so it must be true. Like we used to believe, right? Everything you read, right? And on hard copy, you're like, this is all true. And, and then you kind of go, then you kind of realize, well, sometimes people have an agenda. Sometimes they have a, a way to pervert or twist or, or selectively choose certain details. And then there's other places that are very factual and very accurate. It's really hard to try to determine that. The reason I'm telling you that is because as Christians, when we talk to people, you have to reach them where they are, okay? What we cannot do as the church, we cannot assume our way of reaching the world is unlocking our doors on Sunday morning. That's not evangelism. That's just unlocking some doors, okay? What we have to do is reach people where they are. Um, for years, before I was a pastor, um, I worked with high schoolers. I can tell you the language that I would use was much different. Right? I had to speak in a way, I couldn't sit there and go, guys, let me tell you about justification and sanctification. Right? Let me talk about the uh, epistemological you know, reality of revelation. And they'd be like, uh, just glaze over. Right? you got to teach me where I am. Right? If, if, when you guys know I do a children's message during church, I don't stand up and just kind of start quoting words that have four or five syllables. Okay? Uh, because that would get lost. I mean, you got to speak to them where they are. If there's a person who is not a believer, you can't start telling them about Jesus as if they should know who he is. you got to come to them where they are. And then a lot of times that comes through a dialogue to kind of go, what do you know? Somebody was asking me just the other day, they said, Pastor, I'm kind of having a problem talking to my neighbor. Uh, this is you know, where we're kind of having this discussion. It was sort of theological, but boy, just barely. And, and I said, and I told him about Jesus, and he said, I just don't believe that. And I said, well, maybe you got to start earlier in the story, right? Maybe you got to start with, do you think there's a God, right? Instead of talking about Jesus as the savior of the world, maybe you just got to go, maybe he doesn't even know what he thinks about God or a God or is there a God or whatever. So you got to come to them where they are. And, and so in our attempt in, in apostolic preaching, and apostolic means what the, comes out of the word of God, we want to make sure that we are understanding where people are. So let me kind of make the case here. So he reasoned with them in the synagogue, 
right? Paul reasons with them in the synagogue, and he goes through, uh, and it says, let me just read this. Uh, it says, so Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious, right? A little flattery, okay? I've, I've earned a listening, right, or a hearing. He says, for I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. I, I care about what you're doing. I'm familiar with it. I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. So there were all these altars, and just so that the Athenians uh, covered it all, they even had a, a, an altar to any god that we didn't catch, right? One that we don't know. So he's, I'm covering all the bases, okay? Um, it says, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim you. Use something that they knew. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places, that they should seek God uh, in the hope that they may feel their way um, toward him and find him, yet it is actually not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, and even some of your own poets have said, we, for we are indeed his offspring. So he begins by talking about what they know, what they're familiar with. Um, I, this this might ruffle some of your feathers. Uh, but you guys know I'm not too afraid of that. Uh, when I would work with young people, a lot of times I found that they were uh, much more open to contemporary Christian music because they were unfamiliar with hymnody, right? They hadn't come into a church. They have no familiarity with it. I, I remember when I was in St. Louis and I was the associate pastor and I was responsible for high school and, and college age, young adults, kind of that age. And uh, on Wednesday nights was usually our youth group night. We'd gather together. We had a, we had a, a down at the bottom of our hill where our church was, down at the bottom of the hill was an old Hardee's restaurant. Remember Hardee's? And uh, it went out of business and we took it over. It became our youth building, which was kind of cool. They had a separate place. Uh, the adults all love that, right? Uh, they're not in our basement. <laughs> they're not, you know, we're not finding Nerf darts in the sanctuary uh, and stuff like that. <laughs> so uh, on Wednesdays, we'd have youth group. Well, like during Advent and Lent, I would come and uh, I would sometimes conduct services on Wednesday nights. So we would take youth group and we'd say, okay, we're all going to come up, all the youth, and come up to church, okay, and do church, and then go into the gymnasium and the school and play around. So it would be a little bit different youth group. I found what was so odd because I would show up and do the service in my robe, my all, right? And how the youth treated me when I was in that robe. Right? Most of the time when I'd come to youth group, I'd kind of wear a bowling shirt and blue jeans or whatever. Megan's laughing, right? And, uh, and, and so forth. They'd come in high five to Pastor Eric and so forth and hanging out, listening to music, playing games and so forth. And they'd come into church and they're just kind of like, Pastor Gledhill, you know, this, this really formal. I'm like, it's still me. I'm just wearing a robe. And they're like, but I'm not familiar with that. That's unfamiliar to me. And it, and it created right off the bat a distance. Now I could say, well, let's, let's teach through that. Uh, you can. Right? Or you can try to meet them where they are and say, how can we walk with you where you are? That's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't say, hey, I've got really important news. Meet me in the synagogue every Saturday at 2 o'clock. And that's where I'll teach. Right? No, it kind of went hanging out with the sinners. Right? The lost ones and things like that. It went to them. And so when we see this, we understand here's what's important. So Paul begins, he says, I want to make for a case for God in general. He says, when you look around at everything that's been made, I can tell you, I'm going to tell you about the one who made it. Because when they would look at all their altars, all the altars had different jobs. You guys know that in Greek mythology and Roman mythology. They all had different jobs. The god of war, the god of the uh, fertility, the god of harvest, the god of, you know, whatever. And they just, everybody had a job because it made sense to them, right? Everybody has a job to do and then everything gets done. Paul comes in and goes, you're asking the right questions. I know you're religious people. And I want you to know that there is a god. In fact, you're actually spending time watching and, and directing your worship in this you know, altar to no name, uh, to no God. And, and, uh, and, and I want to tell you who he is. And they're like, hey, there's, there's one supreme God. That makes sense. He said all that's been made. A lot of times I find when I have conversations with people about creation, evolution, I'll circle back to that. Most of the time, you know, people end up painting themselves in a corner when they kind of go, well, this is what I believe. This is my science textbook. My teachers have taught me. And I'm like, okay, so let's walk through that. And, and you actually get to a point where I don't really know how everything started. And it means that somebody had to start it. And that, that's kind of, I've told you before, you know, in, in, the, in the science textbook when they say everything started with the Big Bang. What's the natural question as a Christian? 
where'd the stuff come from that went bang? You're not actually at the beginning of the story. You're just like, oh, the big bang happened. You're like, what went bang? Well, stuff, where'd it come from? It was always there. Well, that's not the start of a story. The start of a story is there was nothing. And suddenly something was there. And I'm like, well, how do you explain that? Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, right? God created. It's the only thing that makes sense. Even scientifically even makes sense. Not that I can prove it, but you kind of go, there's got to be a start, okay? The point is, is that Paul makes a case in the beginning for God in a general sense. And if I went on and kept reading, and we can later, uh, then he makes for a, for a case for God in particular. And that's when he brings in Jesus. That's the point, right? So his apologetics, his defense uh, of the faith is say, I want to tell you about God first. And you keep it general. One of the things that we often do is we make assumptions because we tend to live life in this arena right here. Okay? Like, for example, uh, what I'm doing in Bible class is not evangelizing. Right? This is not evangelism. This is instruction. And it's instruction because this is halftime. Right? Now, if, if you have somebody here, if somebody is here, if somebody's watching, right, you're going to hear about Jesus, but it's not the thrust of this gathering. It's not to say, I want to tell you and demonstrate to you that there is a God that loves you and that love took a form and that's Jesus of Nazareth and he did this and this and this and this is what it accomplishes. That would be a different gathering. This is more of an instruction, a teaching, so that you are equipped to do that. The problem is, is we don't have a great deal of experience with non-Bible class people, or at least not enough. So we're intimidated, right? And somebody kind of asked you, I had somebody come up and ask me today, they says, I'm, I'm having this discussion with a friend of mine who's Jewish. And, uh, and I'm like, well, that's, that's going to stretch a little bit, your understanding, because we don't spend a lot of time together as Lutherans with Jewish people. Okay, we should. We should spend time with Jewish people and Catholic people and non-denominational people and atheist people and, and, and all people just so that there are opportunities to share Jesus. That's why we're here. We're not here again to get in a big circle and pat each other on the back and go, you going to heaven? Me too. Isn't that great? Right? That is not why we're here. If, if that were the case, God might as well take you back home. Okay? Instead, our job is to reach and talk to people. So Paul demonstrates. The reason I'm showing you this, this is a great model for us. When you talk about defending the faith, you're like, listen, make a case for God. Don't jump too far, right? Nothing worse than, than when I sit down and, and hear somebody talk and they just start quoting scripture. No, this is what the Lord says. And they're like, what if you don't happen to believe that this book is true or reliable or dependable? So you're quoting from the, that's like a, a Muslim coming up to me and goes, this is what the Quran says. And I would kind of go, I don't accept that as the authority in my life. So therefore your quoting doesn't make any sense to me doesn't appeal to me. What you have to do is you have to demonstrate it. You have to reason it out. You, you might have to live it in such a way that I kind of go, I get it. You realize that how we live is a, is a better testimony most of the time uh, than opening with the word of God. Okay? Because they want to see something in you. Why are you not afraid? Why are you compassionate to people that are not equally compassionate back to you? What is it about you that's different? Let me tell you. It has to do with God. Right? And, and that might be all you do. Is, is just tell them about God in general. But it may open up doors to where you can then talk about God in particular. Now, when we talk about God in particular, we are always going to come to the point of the resurrection. One of the things I talked about last week, and, and it's, it's always what we talk about as church, if it weren't for the resurrection, we have no hope. We have a great example. We have a great teacher uh, in Jesus of Nazareth. But without the resurrection, there is no hope. Right? It has to be the resurrection. It has got to be our end point all the time. And that's why Jesus, everything he was doing, I was reading this morning uh, in the sermon, uh, and you probably, if you guys were in the early service or in the late service, you'll hear it. Um, you'll hear that one verse that we talked about in Luke, that key theme verse where Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. And we're like, it's not really that dramatic of a verse. And yet that's always been what Jesus was about. I have to go to Jerusalem. That's when the deed of salvation will be done. And he's talking about death and then ultimately the resurrection. That's got to be where we end up. I, I've shared with you every single world religion, Buddhism, Hinduism, um, Taoism, every, every ism that's out there, short of Christianity, you go to the tomb of their leader, it still has him there. Right? Christianity is the only one with an empty tomb. It's the only one that had victory for you. Every other religion, you have to do something in order to warrant some kind of reward. 
whether it's paradise, nirvana, total enlightenment, whatever the case may be, your own planet. Uh, but for Christianity, he does this for us. It's a gift, right? Delivered for absolutely nothing for us. Uh, it, look in Acts 26. Would somebody read that Acts 26 verse 1? Nice and loud for me, please. So Agrippa said to Paul, if you have permission to speak for yourself, then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. Made his defense. That is the word apologia, where we get the word apologetic. Now, apologetic has nothing to do with making an apology, right? I, I know it seems to kind of line that self up. The root of an apology actually comes from telling the truth. Okay, so when you think of that, like when I make an apology, it usually means here's the truth. I did this, I said this, I am truly sorry. You know when you say truly, right? That's, I'm telling you the truth, I'm sorry. That's where we get it from. But making an apology in a defense is not being weak and sorry. It is speaking the truth. And I pray in a winsome way, right? Uh, in a winsome way, it's to make a defense. In fact, in Philippians 1, somebody have that for me? 1, 15 and 16. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Paul actually believes that this was his vocation. This is my job to defend the faith. That's not a bad way to look at it, right? Um, now, your vocation is not necessarily your occupation. Some of us have an occupation, well, all of us have an occupation, um, whether we get paid for it or not. But our vocation is what you do as a member of this citizenry, right? As a member of this country, as a member of this world, the human race, we have a vocation. And as a Christian, Paul's kind of challenging us as he steps forward. There's nothing that makes us different than Paul other than his experiences. And, and his experiences aren't greater or less than your experiences or mine, right? Um, I, I, remember, uh, I remember when I was in high school, and I went to a big public high school, about 2,000 kids. And uh, this, was back in the, this was back in the 80s. And uh, I remember we had a, 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 what do they call them, an assembly in the gym. And a guy came in. And he was a Christian guy. This, is, this tells you how long ago it was, right? In a public school, Christian guy comes in and deliver a message. And he had a, a very moving message. He had been on drugs. Uh, he had been in jail. And uh, God had gotten a hold of him, really kind of cleaned his life up. And he was a great uh, witness and, a, and uh, a great motivational speaker. And I remember coming out, and my, my good buddy Brian was with me. He goes, what would you think of him? And I'm like, man, I wish I was on crack. <laughs> and, and, I, and I said that not to be flippant, even though I was often the class clown. Um, I actually was, was lamenting the fact that I have a boring testimony, right? That I was like, his testimony was so moving. I came out, I was just like, that's awesome. You could say, I was this, I was lost, I was doomed. And then God got a hold of me, because Brian, my buddy, we were both in youth group together, so we were Christians. And so I was like, man, I wish I had a drug problem. Right? I, I didn't really wish that, but I just I had this recognition that I'm like, wow, my testimony is so milk toast. Right? And then you come to find out that your and my testimony is exactly what it's meant to be. Right? And you use what you have for that reason, right? If we were all lost individuals, then what what does somebody who kind of goes, but I don't do any of those things? I can't identify with what it means. I, I had a guy once come to my office in, in, uh, in a previous church, and uh, he says, I'm, I'm struggling with alcohol. I, I have an addiction. I have a problem and so forth. And, and, and he said, you know, I need help. And, uh, and I, I said, I can, I, can, I can be with you. I'll help you through this. But I don't understand. I said, I don't have that same issue. Now, I do know the truth, and, and I know what, what helps. I know the great physician Okay, but I, it's not so that we're not built so that we have to identify with everyone's wrestles. Okay, but you deliver from where you are. Okay, Paul says, right, we're all members of the body of Christ. We can't all be eyes, can't all be ears, can't all be hands or feet. You all have a part to play. And if you play that role well, the whole body works. Okay, uh, and, and that's, that's, the, that's the truth for us. Okay. Now, apologetics, I'm finally getting around to defending this uh, or defining it for you. Fact-based, objective approach of defending Christianity, okay? Fact-based, objective approach. This is why um, I think we see a lot of it in Acts, because it comes from Luke. Luke is really good, right? He's, he's analytic. We heard that, analytical. Um, and he, he approaches things from this and this and this. Guys, there is not only one way 
to defend the faith. I, I'm going to approach it this way in this class, but I want you to understand there's not just one, and I'll, I hopefully will demonstrate that. Some people will object to apologetics, claiming you can't persuade anyone to believe. Only the Holy Spirit can give the gift of faith. Right? Some people would say, why would you, why would you try to use facts and data and observation and reason to try to draw someone to Jesus? Nobody can do that except the Holy Spirit, um, to which I would say it's absolutely true. But the task of the apologists are these, right? Are these. The first one is your job as a, an apologist, a Christian, clear away obstacles, Okay. I, I spend actually a fair amount of time as a pastor talking about obstacles. We call them sin, right? And if somebody is wrestling with sin and going, boy, I really want to follow Jesus and learn more about him and clean my life up and so forth, but I really don't want to let go of this stuff, then we kind of go, guess what we got to talk about? We don't just say, well, just, just go and follow Jesus. He doesn't really care what you're like, right? He, he cares very much. It's kind of like my, my son kind of saying, hey, I, I want to just kind of hang out here, but I'm going to do it out here in the middle of the street. I'm like, no, you probably ought to get out of the street. That'd be the first thing you ought to do. We can kind of enjoy a relationship not in danger, not in something that is, that is uh, risky for you. So clear away the obstacle. Second is to show the claims are founded in facts, right? Demonstrate them. Reason them out. Um, one of the things I do, and I'll, I'll kind of come back to this. This is probably one of the, the, the more passionate debates on me on creation and evolution I think uh, one of the things I stated to you guys, we talked about creation evolution, I, I don't know, a year or two ago. Um, I think there are more facts supporting creation in this world than would support evolution. I believe that. And, and I can tell you, I've spent a lot of time wrestling with it, reading it, and studying it, and so <laughs> forth. In fact, I would tell you that nothing you will see in nature, in science, will ever counter what it says in Genesis, ever. Right? What you see in the world lines up with Genesis. If you have to go to science and try to explain, you got big leaps that you got to make, right? Like from monkey to man, or the biggest one, amoeba to man. That's a pretty big leap, right? And yet scientifically, you'll struggle making that connect, right? Uh, and when I say struggle, impossible, okay? We just scientifically can't do it. So you're going to find that God did not leave us without the ability to reason. He's given us five senses. That's for a reason. He's given us an intellect, right, for us to reason and figure things out. And he said, so the evidence is there. In fact, in Romans and Matthew, he says, uh, it, my creation, everything that you see, including yourself, is a testimony to me, right? If, if you get right down to it and kind of go, well, how did I get here? That's a good question. I promise you an honest pursuit of that truth, how did I get here, will point you to God. I don't mean just in a sense of, of faith you will get to that reality. And the reason I know that, because God says so. He says, my creation is a testimony to my existence. It's not a where's Waldo, right? That if you just kind of look real hard and follow the clues, you might come to the conclusion it's God. That's why one of the reasons I, I argue this is I don't think there's such a thing as an atheist. And when I say that, I don't believe there are people that do not believe in God. I believe there are people that reject God, right? And I think there's a difference in that. Okay? Now, somebody kind of go, I don't believe there's a God. I'm like, you don't want to believe there's a God. But my God says it's actually obvious. right? So you're not believing in him is not actually an option. Otherwise, you could show up in heaven one day, on judgment day, and kind of go, I had no way of knowing it was you. right? And God going, okay, come on in. <laughs> you know, right? I'm going to grade on the curve, okay, uh, and so forth. It's not at all. Third one, what an apologist does. Provide a positive case for the claims of Christ. The reason that Christ, God in the flesh, walked this earth was to demonstrate for us. We were meant to learn something from Jesus, not just to sit back and watch it like a commercial uh, in the break of our show that we're watching. Oh, this is Jesus walking the earth. Instead, pay attention to what he said, what he did. In our sermon today, if you're in the early service, you got it in the, in the sermon, but if you're coming to late service... Jesus rides into Jerusalem for the last time, the triumphal entry, what we would say is kind of Palm Sunday kind of thing. When he rides in, there is so much that is happening on that day that the Jews would have seen through that exercise of him triumphantly entering into the holy city of God that would have told people, aha, this is not just a run-of-the-mill parade. This is not some rabble rabbi that comes in and, and has some cool story and some tricks to do. This is 
is a sign over and over and over again of something that is um, meaningful and life-changing, in fact, eternally changing. So how do we do apologetics? We're not going to answer all that because obviously that's what this class is going to be about. Uh, and I'll give you some examples. But how do we do it? Well, there's two ways that we can break it down. One is inductive ways, uh, evidential, using pieces and arguments to lead to the whole truth. This is probably the most common way. This is the way I approach it many times when I teach, using stories. I use examples, scripture, right? Building pieces after piece, and eventually we erect some kind of foundational wall or, or support. That's what we do. Take some data. When we instruct our children, whether it's through Sunday school, through confirmation, um, we are doing it inductively many times to be able to say, listen, here's what's true. Here's what the commandments are. Here's what the creed means. Here's the Lord's prayer. And we put those things together and we learn these things. Most of the time when I preach is mostly inductive, right? Here's the word of God. Here's what it teaches. Here's the background I want you to understand. Today is a great one for that, talking about why did Jesus ride a donkey? Why did people wave the palms? Why did they throw their cloaks down? Those all had reasons that pointed people to the whole truth that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, even though he didn't fit you know, the, the context of what they were looking for. We're waiting for a king, a military king. And they're like, and here's this guy, royalty on a, on a donkey. And they're like, doesn't seem to fit right um, so what we see correlates with the truth, okay? Now, that is, um, that's good inductive reasoning, okay? Um, I've often told people this, that, um, that argue with the truth of God and say, well, the truth of God is not my truth. And I'm like, well, you can argue whether or not you choose to follow it, but God's truth is absolute. And, and it's, it's no different than gravity, okay? Every one of you is right now, including me, are benefiting from gravity right now. You're not floating around, which is good because the fans are on, okay? Um, have that Willy Wonka scene, right? Um, every one of us. Now, if, if somebody dropped a pen uh, where you're sitting right now and it didn't fall down to the paper below but floated around, you would have to reevaluate and say, what I see does not correlate with what I believe to be true. I would say gravity seems to pull things down to the center of our core of this planet. Always does. And as soon as it doesn't, you go, problem. Okay, so from a scientific standpoint, it's all in here, guys. I got to share it sometimes, right? We make a guess, we use a hypothesis, we form a theory, and then we make a law. That's a scientific approach, right? So you kind of go, um, some of you have gone deer hunting the last couple of weeks. Uh, you probably use some of that theory out there. You're like, so here's what I think. Here's what I try and I test it. I have a theory and then I start acting on it. Right? So if you're like, I'm going to take one of those old fashioned car horns, right, out in the woods, and that will call deer. Okay? So I think that's my, my statement, and then I try it, and I do it for a whole weekend. I don't see any deer. Okay? A lot of old fashioned cars show up, but no deer. Okay? So what I do is I go back and I reevaluate what do I think is true and right and so forth. So what we do is as we look at the things of God and we look at his word and we study his word, we start to find things that there are things that correlate with what we think the truth is. If somebody tells you, oh, I read this new book, it said this about God and it's different than what you've taught. If you hear a preacher preach something that is contrary to what you believe from the word of God, that's going to come out. You're going to say, what I see, what I hear, what I know does not correlate with what I read in God's word, okay? <laughs> this leads um, to, uh, to be, this tends to be a more positive focus. What I mean by positive is, is you're saying things that are, um, they build, it's encouraging, um, and it's, it's, I want to tell you, I want to reveal something to you. Instead of, uh, I'll say in another way, and this is not a bad way, but it's just another way deductive. This is more philosophical, not so analytical or, exp uh, or experimental. This assumes that something is true, and then you show how the parts validate the truth, right? So you make a statement that God is real, that God is true, and then the things you see will reaffirm that, okay? Now, the reason that this is a little more challenging in an apologetic approach is most of the time we don't agree on the truth, if I talk to someone who doesn't know God, I can't go, okay, can we disagree there's a God? They're like, no. 
Okay, well, I had a whole bunch of things I was going to show you that affirms that there's a God. So now we switch it around, make it inductive. So where do you think we came from? Now you're talking about experiments, right? Data, uh, understanding, analytics. Now, something is true if all its parts cohere well. That's what deductive uh, uh, reasoning does in an apologetic so forth uh, approach to it. If something is true, then everything you see, everything that's related to that, will agree with it. You guys kind of see that it's sort of opposite, where you build little parts into the truth. Deductive is you kind of assume the truth, and everything you see around it ought to support it, okay, um, and, and so forth. This tends to be, unfortunately, a more negative focus because you tend to chip away critically of anything that doesn't support the truth. So if I have a discussion, for instance, with a Muslim, and, and we, we, we wouldn't agree on this, but if we did and say, well, Allah and God of the universe, Yahweh, um, are essentially the same people. And they'd say, so we're, we're really talking about the same thing. You're like, no, we're not. Okay. But if we did, we would start there and then we would talk about, okay, what are the facts? Do they cohere? Do they align with that? We'd find that Allah and Yahweh are nowhere near the same descriptions. Now, there is no Allah, so understand that I'm not comparing one and the other. Um, it's not even apples and oranges. It's make-believe and fact. But the point is, is as we see those things, but what we'd end up doing is chipping away as a Christian at the facts of what is believed about Allah. It'd have to be critical in a sense, not to say, I'm going to build a case for God and ignore Allah because we're trying to assimilate these two are the same. We're coming to that same truth, okay? So my point is, I don't want to belabor this because we'll spend too much time on this, uh, is that we recognize that inductive tends to be a more academic approach, right? It's, it's just something we're more, it's more Greek oriented in some ways that we take facts and instruction and it leads us to a greater understanding, okay? Deductive is, we take a, a philosophical understanding of truth, of reality, of God, and then we look at all the things that then contribute to it. it it'll make some sense uh, as we go. All right? It also seeks to deconstruct the opposing belief by demonstrating inaccuracies. All right? uh, to deconstruct. That's what makes it more of a negative approach. Now, I, I can tell you that's what often happens when we debate. When you have a debate, and I mean a healthy debate, Okay, so let me let me go all the way back to this. Da, 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 da. Right? A healthy debate. Gentleness and respect. Okay? If you want to discuss things with a friend of yours and says that, well, this is what I believe, you're like, okay, well, what about this? I found that sometimes if somebody sits down with me, they've opened themselves up to that dialogue. Right? They they kind of say, I I Tell me a little bit of what you think. And then a lot of times I'll go, what do you think? Um, one of the things I have found, guys, this is a good little key piece to, to recollect, I guess, from our time. When you talk with someone around Christianity and, and you have an opportunity to have that dialogue, here's what I want you to remember. Ask questions. That's what you ought to do more than anything else as a Christian. Ask questions. Because what we tend to do is we start talking. We start throwing facts at them. See, questions get you to understand where they are, what they know, what they believe. And that actually helps you kind of say this. I, I had somebody once, um, I asked a question in a car park store, uh, which for me is dangerous. Um, I, I go in there, I'm kind of like, so here's the sound it's making. You know, here, fix this, right? You know, like that. Uh, they said, what's wrong with that? Nothing, I just got a wheeze. I'm going to tell you in a second what's the problem. The point is, is that you want to find out what it is that they believe. I had this person, I was telling them something, and they were completely on another tangent. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's the car engine, not the wheel or something. We were just on two different planes because they weren't necessarily picking up what I thought I was explaining to them. When someone talks to you and says, this is what I struggle with believing in a God. I have people ask me questions like, why does God allow suffering? That's a great question. It's a hard one to answer sometimes. But if I know that that's what they're at, I don't have to just start quoting the Ten Commandments to them. Right? Or I don't have to kind of go, oh, we have a creed. Let me share it with you. And they're like, okay. So how does that help me understand that God allows suffering in some way? And how do I wrap my head around that? By listening to what they are struggling with kind of helps you kind of go, let me customize it. That's why a doctor usually asks you when you come into the office, what's wrong? You don't just walk in there kind of go, guess. <laughs> You're on the clock. 
Okay? No, we go in there kind of go, hey, this hurts when I do this. Over the okay, now I know what the need is. So I can address that and not kind of go, here, I'm, uh, pull on your ear a little bit. Does that help at all? And so forth. C.S. Lewis, I just wanted to mention him. Um, probably one of the better inductive uh, apologists in uh, modern time. That book that he wrote called Mere Christianity, if you haven't read it, it's an excellent book. Um, he approaches things, I feel, uh, as a contemporary novelist and, and theologian um, in ways that are approachable. Um, if you've ever seen the movies or read the book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and Prince Caspian, the Silver Chair, and there's different versions of it and so forth, different uh, examples. He teaches a lot of theology with imagery that invites us in. Right, Like when you read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the lion is the Christ figure. And it's got amazing symbolism. And, and as a Christian, it's really you know, pretty amazing when you read and go, wow, that's Jesus. But as a non-Christian, people will read that and they'll learn things through that. They kind of go, it's not like you have faith in Aslan, the, the lion afterwards, but it's not a big reach, at least in America, to then hear about Jesus and kind of go, I kind of know how Jesus lived his life in certain ways from that story or movie, for that matter, um, and has an opportunity to do that. So what we are going to do, folks, over the next few weeks is uh, I'm going to walk through some specifics of the faith and help us learn how to defend it. I, I want to I add another blade, another tool to your Leatherman or your Swiss Army knife uh, or whatever it is so that we are equipped to go back out and be able to talk about these things. So we're going to deal with the basics uh, in the Christian faith. We're not going to deal with the minutia, which, and I say minutia, like the things that don't come up very readily in, in everyday conversations, but the things that do. You know, how do I, how do I talk to my family member, uh, my coworker, my neighbor, um, you know, a total stranger about this? And, and how do I do it? And this is really key in a winsome way. You're going to hear that word a lot in this class, winsome, because I think we do more damage trying to evangelize people in an inappropriate way than we, by doing nothing. Now, doing nothing is not acceptable, but doing a poor job, it's even worse, right? I really think it does even worse, because what you do is not only do you not help them, but now they've got this stigma of what they think of Christians. Because most people will judge all of us from one of us, right? And so, boy, let that pressure sink in, okay? And so when you drive home today, um, remember, one of us represents all of us, and that is pressure, folks, let me tell you. Uh, when I'm on my motorcycle, i got to remember that sometimes. <laughs> All right, let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your word. And, and when I say that again, I don't just mean the Bible, even though that is awesome. Lord, I am thankful for Jesus. And uh, Lord, he lived it, demonstrated it, spoke it, um, delivered it, and then sends us out as it. We are the word of God, the, the hands and the feet and the mouthpiece of God. And so, Lord, may we be willing participants. And, and Lord, may we individually as humans get out of the way and let you speak through us. And so, Lord, if we feel like our tank is a little empty, let us refill. That's what this is for. And uh, Lord, when we've topped it off, which we have done today, um, Lord, let us go out and distribute to everyone we come in contact with. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.